All right, let's see. Greetings, everyone. So let's get ready to start. I have with us today, Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas is an assistant professor in the, uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences. She has an interest in multiple things, uh, quite a few. We wear many hats, as you know. So she has an interest in promoting environmental awareness, researching the natural history of invertebrate species, particularly local and tropical spider communities. Pretty cool, but again, not the focus of this talk. Effective communication of science through community-engaged learning research, teaching, and outreach. I bet you can guess which one she's here today to talk about. <laughs> She served as a co-PI on an NSF-funded project entitled Outside, Over, Under, and Through. Students informally discover the environment. That project's goals were to improve content knowledge, stimulate interaction with nature, train naturalists, and integrate technology into informal science education and their experiences for middle school students. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Louisiana Masters Naturalists of, Greater, of the Greater New Orleans, and she's received close to or oh, more than $780,000 to fund her research in environment educational programs and has worked with over 10,000 students. Like, that's a lot, by the way. 10,000, oh my goodness. Ranging from kindergarten to graduate school in formal and informal science settings, along with teaching for 20 years. So I don't know what more I can say. It sounds like we have a, a celebrity here today. So, Dr. <laughs> Thomas, take us through your journey. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, so thanks for joining today to learn about this information. Um, yes, I do wear a lot of hats and I do have a lot of interest. So, um, but today, um, Dr. Buford asked me to speak to you all about some of the informal uh, STEM education that I do. And so I chose to focus on um, just an introduction to what informal, or we can shorten it because, of course, we love acronyms, iSTEM education, some of the best practices, and then give you some examples of some of the projects that we've done in order to um, really learn from the best practices and implement the best practices. And so, um, you know, I'm at a university, and, and prior to being at Loyola University, I was at Southern Miss, and so um, my PhD is from your program. So um, I believe in your program, and um, y'all are doing great work. Uh, but the thing that I want to stress is that those more than 10,000 students I've worked with, I'm not necessarily in the classroom every day. I'm doing informal work with them. And so let's um, dive into what that means and um, give some examples of this, because I'm sure you can relate to a lot of these things that I'll talk about um, in your coursework, but also in your own experience of um, teaching. So if you um, are interested in social media, I put a couple of things on here if you wanna follow any of the work that we do, um, and we can talk about that at the end, but let's let's go ahead and get started. So first question, you know, if we're, we're starting to talk about um, informal STEM education, we need to define what informal STEM education is. And so it's just anything that's outside of a traditional classroom. So any kind of museum or a science center or a library, anywhere there's any kind of um, STEM education. And so um, any kind of community engaged, community based organizations as well. And, um, and so I chose to include this picture right here because one of the things that I did when I was a professor at USM was to help get informal STEM education started at your very own Lake Thoreau Environmental Center. So hopefully you all have experienced that and um, are participating in some of the great work that's being done out there. I also serve on that board. So we meet um, at least once a year. And so I keep up with some of the types of projects that go on out there. But that's one of my um, fondest memories of being a professor at Southern Miss is, is working at Lake Thoreau. So anything that you do that's outside of traditional classroom is going to be considered iSTEM. And people, you know, when they're new to understanding and learning about uh, this informal setting, they, you know, they, they want to know, well, why is this important? And so um, my, my why can go on and on and on and could probably fill this this full hour, um, but to just break it down to a few important um, talking points about informal, 
First of all, it allows for um, different learning styles and multiple intelligences. I'm sure that's stuff that you're learning in some of your classes, um, and it's so important. And we're so in tuned today um, in 2023 to understanding DEI and that not only is diversity, equity, and inclusion important, but there are learning styles and multiple intelligences that um, people have that don't um, aren't traditional. And so in formal science ed, we have found through the uh, literature, it allows for these different kinds of intelligences to shine. Um, it also complements, of course, supplements, it deepens, it enhances classroom science studies. And the National Science Teachers Association position statement on informal science ed um, talks about this in a lot of detail. And also it increases the time participants can be engaged in a project. So definitely important for, um, for you to uh, incorporate aspects of informal science education into um, your formal teachings that many of you will go on to do. And then one of my favorite quotes that is from 2010, but I still like to use it because it's still relevant today, comes out of a, um, an, a, a short article in that was published in Nature. And um, the whole article was about informal science learning and, and why it's and, and of its importance. But my favorite quote is that much of what people know about science is learned informally. And if you want to dive into that article and, you know, get the actual data about how much time is spent in that traditional and formal learning compared to what um, you will do the rest of your life, it's pretty impressive. So if we don't have these other opportunities, then people won't understand science. And we all know that that's important to everything that we do. Um, so what are some of the best practices? Um, if you, you know, take time to review the literature about informal science ed, you're going to learn a whole lot about the best practices. Um, and so it's important in any kind of research and, and area that you um, focus on to learn best practices so that, you know, you're taking advantage of, of other people's work and you're standing on the shoulders of those giants. Um, but also because um, they're tried and true, and most of them are research-based and supported. And so this list is longer than seven, but I chose to just talk about um, these and, and talk about how I've incorporated these seven best practices. Um, and so, of course, you can read more detail, but I'm thinking that I'm preaching to the choir here with um, students that are enrolled in the Center for um, STEM Education that you know hands-on is um, definitely one of the best practices in learning, period. Um, but iSTEM education allows and provides for a lot of that. Um, and that, of course, goes hand in hand with inquiry-based learning. And, um, and these best practices are to encourage that. So any kind of informal um, setting where you can get kids and people to have hands-on and really think through processes is always the best learning. Um, way to learn. And then uh, relating it to things that are tangible and real world. And so I'll show you some of the ways that I've done that in um, two of the projects we've recently completed. And um, so that's number three. So four is to emphasize collaboration. You're probably learning through your classes or if, if you've had been, you know, at a anywhere, worked anywhere, that anything that you're going to do in your life with your career is going to be collaborative. There are very few jobs today that uh, where you work in a silo. And so um, iSTEM education definitely emphasizes collaboration and it's a good skill to learn uh, because it's what ha happens in the real world. Diverse representation is always important when you are um, implementing these best practices. And that can be from the perspective of not only the people who are um, doing the um, education piece, but also the way in which you present it. That's the multiple intelligences and, and diverse ways of um, teaching. Make it fun. Why not have fun at work and, um, and trying to teach others about science um, education? And then also always connect with the experts. You don't have to be an expert in everything. Um, that's goes back to collaboration. Collaborate with people who are the experts. Bring in the experts for different um, experiences that you have and um, and and it 
reduces the pressure on you as an academic or as a um, as a um, practitioner. But also, it's just important because people are experts for a reason. <laughs> it's all based on literature. So what I want to do is take those um, three concepts of, you know, what is iSTEM education? Why is it important? And then what are the best practices? And go from there. And so I thought what I would do is show you how I implement those best practices through two, um, what I would consider to be really fun projects I've done over the past five or six years um, at Loyola University in New Orleans. And um, so the first one, and I, you know what I've just realized? I don't have um, the chat up. So if y'all have questions as we go, so feel free to um, unmute yourselves and um, ask any questions as I go through this or put them in the chat and I'll I'll get to them at the end. Or I'll, uh, Dr. Down, if you want to interrupt me, I'm I'm happy for, or Dr. Buford, happy for y'all to do that. So, okay. Um, first project I want to talk about is a huge collaborative project um, that was called BioBlitz, using the urban environment as a learning lab. So I live in New Orleans, an urban setting, and Loyola University is uptown, right on St. Charles Avenue, right across from Audubon Park. And so it is one of the um, really great things about being at Loyola is having access to the park right across the street. So I try to use it as much as possible. Um, we use our urban environment all the time and try to learn. So this was a, a natural project for us to, to start. And let me start by just saying, okay, what is a BioBlitz? They're becoming more and more popular. Um, but one of the definitions that you can see I just grabbed from Wikipedia is it's an intense period of biological surveying in an attempt to record all the living species within a designated area. There's a little bit more to that definition, so I'll put some dots there. But the idea is um, to utilize this a bio blitz for what you're trying to accomplish. So I've been involved before I did this project myself. I was involved as a participant in a bio blitz that was a 24 hour period. And then I was involved in one that lasted a week. Um, and so it's really depending on what you're trying to learn from this intense period of biological surveying to find out what organisms are in an area. And so um, these are a couple of pictures that um, that's actually me looking at a, a tiny critter, which is what I tend to do with a loop. And you can see the engagement of this student um, right here trying to to learn from that experience. So. Um, serving as the model for how you go about seeing small things. And then this is actually one of your own. Um, this is Marx McWhorter, who used to be, uh, was an undergraduate and got his master's degree um, through USM. And um, I worked very closely with him and he uh, often comes and volunteers with us for different things. And so I got him to come and, and uh, serve as an expert on herps for this project, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, one of the things that I'm fascinated with is um, is the whole chat GPT AI stuff. So I um, I asked chat GPT on March 23rd what a bio blitz was, and this was the definition they gave me. Um, I don't know if y'all are embracing chat GPT or what the status is there, but I thought I would include this because this is a pretty good definition of what a bio blitz is. It's an event where groups of volunteers, including scientists, naturalists, and members of the public work together to find and identify as many species of plants, animals, and other organisms as possible in a designated area during a specific time period, typically 24 hours. The goal of a BioBlitz is to survey the biodiversity of a particular ecosystem and gain a better understanding of the species that live there. Participants use a variety of methods, including observation, photography, and DNA analysis to identify the different species they find. Bioblitzes can be held in a range of different environments from urban parks to remote wilderness areas and can provide valuable data for conservation efforts and scientific research. It's a little bit scary how good that definition is. Um, so I thought I would share this with you all um, so you can see the, the kinds of uh, ways you can summarize um, some of the, the best practices and, and definitions of things um, as graduate students uh, trying to, to learn these things. Okay, moving on from ChatGPT. Um, all right, so what was this project about? So we were challenged by the um, 
the New Orleans City Park. So I mentioned Audubon Park a minute ago and, and how we use that as the learning lab at Loyola. So we took that concept and when we were tasked with and challenged with doing um, this survey of New Orleans City Park, which I'm showing a map here of. So let me just kind of orient y'all. So y'all are way up here in Hattiesburg. So if you drive south about, mm, about an hour, this right here is the south shore of Lake Pontchartrain. And so um, we got a neighborhood, we've got Lakeview over here. This is the Gentilly neighborhood. And this is Bayou St. John, one of our last um, natural bodies of water that um, is the original way that um, our, our city was uh, founded and discovered by coming up this body of water going to the French Quarter. We could talk about that another time, but on either side or, or bounding, um, this is one boundary of the city park, and you can see right here from this aerial view that it turns into um, this really nice green area and so it's actually 1300 acres which is um bigger than than central park and it is uh, within the city of new orleans and within this 1300 acres is a diverse uh, are several diverse environments there are several golf courses where there are historic oak trees um, there are fishing ponds there are different fields for sports and um and open areas for people to just hike around there's a botanical garden in there, lagoons, um, a forested area. So this is where I'm going to focus in on right here for um, the project that we did that um, I, I started mentioning this. I didn't finish it, but we were tasked, we were challenged by um, the board members of um, City Park to help them figure out the flora and fauna of the park so that they could um, use that information to inform some of their management plans for the future. So I just showed you the full 1,300 acres in the surrounding neighborhoods, but what I want to focus in on now are some of these lagoons, some of them natural, some of them not natural. But I started with the big picture so you could kind of see the connection with water because that's going to tie into this and it's also going to tie into um, the next project I'll tell you about. Uh, but just with this aerial view, you can see right here where my where my mouse is there. This is a golf um, course right here. And a lot of people think golf courses, ah, there's nothing there. There's actually a lot of biodiversity on a golf course, not necessarily with the flora, but the fauna, if there are these old historic oak trees, which we happen to have. And then if you look right here, this is a 26 or so acre portion of the 1300 acres that is a forest that's called Couturier Forest. It's a managed forest, um, but most of it is kept in um, as pristine a, um, a environment as, as possible. And then one more thing I wanna show you is, um, so the golf course is here, it goes across the street over here, um, but right here at the edge, this is a, a part of the um, park where they were trying to really decide, should we keep this, as it's a it's a former golf course that's now used for um, frisbee golf, and uh, I think it's called disc frisbee. Yeah, so they're trying to really help inform what do we do with this? Um, should we keep it natural? Should we make it into um, uh, a more uh, I don't know um, cut area where they they cut the grass regularly? And so um, that's the the bio blitz. So we actually took um, a year. And so this was not one of those 24 hour events. And when we were tasked with doing this, I knew, well, I can't do this alone. Uh, so I collaborate with my dad, who is a professor at Loyola as well, and was our liaison to City Park. And we got um, students who were interested in doing some of this work to carve this out as their senior capstone. So just to give them some credit here, um, we've got in, in the order I have these listed, this is Andrew Harper, who focused on the dragonfly community. Um, I'm going to talk about his project a little bit. This is Shannon Hester, who focused on the spider um, portion of the um, project. Ella did um, some work with aquatic macroinvertebrates. Carolyn um, also worked on some macroinvertebrates. And then um, Kiana focused on the planktonic community in the lagoons. And so have a couple of their critters 
that they um, photographed from their projects up here just to show you. So definitely um, one of the best practices in informal science ed is to collaborate and work with experts. So these became our, our instant experts. Um, so one of the things that we, we do as scientists, of course, is when we were tasked with, you know, helping City Park find out these answers. Um, so we had to break it down and figure out, okay, what approach do we want to take? So these are some of the research questions that we asked based on just the spider community. And that's, of course, I chose that because that's my area of expertise. Um, and it was one of the um, carved out portions of this project. So we wanted to know, very simple, what species are found in City Park? We had never asked that question. No one had asked that question. Um, we also wanted to know if the species richness and abundance differed among three unique habitats. So because the, the habitats, there are so many different diverse habitats, we um, focused on three of those to see if there was a difference. We also wanted to know how the spider communities in the different habitats um, were different or how they were similar. Um, and then the, the fourth kind of focus, and, and this stretched across the different taxa, was to find out about land management. We know that they are managing, of course, the golf course. We know that they're managing that, um, that 26 acre park. We wanted to know if the land management and usage, because there is a high usage um, within the park, if they have an effect on the spider species richness and abundance. So those were some of the research questions. I won't dive too deep into some of the uh, data, but I will show you one, one graph about them. Um, but these pictures we got through this project and I thought they were pretty good. So I thought I'd show you, these are some of the more common spider species that we found, but also um, they are common not only here in, in uh, New Orleans, but they're also common in Hattiesburg because I have found them um, regularly, frequently in Hattiesburg. So this right here is a close up of um, Leucage venusta, which is commonly referred to as an orchard spider. It's one of the more common spiders we find um, here in New Orleans, and, and they're also found um, in Hattiesburg. This is a spiny orb weaver, Gasteracantha cancriformis, which is a great, really cool critter. If you Google them and, and see um, there are different colors of this species. There are um, the, I'm showing you the yellow variety, but there's also a white, there's a red, and there's an orange um, variety. All the same species as far as we know, um, but different varieties. And then a little jumping spider right here, Colonus sylvanus. I don't know if there's a common name of that one. That's, that's pretty typical in the spider world. A lot of them don't have common names. Uh, but then this one, I'm sure y'all know if you've ever been out to Lake Thoreau or anywhere in the woods around Hattiesburg, um, because it's the largest spider that we have in Mississippi and in Louisiana. Um, scientific name is Nephiloclavips or Clavipes, and it is commonly known as the golden silk spider. And uh, so they produce a gigantic web and um, you can't miss them when you're walking around in the woods in August and September because they are plentiful. Um, they also have silk that's really strong. Um, their silk is stronger than Kevlar, which is pretty impressive. Um, and I could spend all day talking about those if y'all have questions about the spiders. Um, but let me show you some data that we got from um, those research questions uh, that we were asking. We um, put together a relative abundance graph that shows the difference, uh, different habitats um, across the bottom. So we had our forested area, the um, track that uh, where the Frisbee golf is played, and then the golf course location. And the, uh, the richness is the number of um, individuals, um, species that we found at each location. So there wasn't much difference in, in the richness, but the abundances were very different. And so um, these diversity indices right here, just to show you um, how, do, you know, the, the comparison across these three different locations. Anybody know what this orange lycosidae, what kind of spider that is? Lycosidae. So Shannon was focused on um, the ground dwelling spiders. And so her methodology, which I didn't tell you, um, was focused on ground collecting. So the orange um, of these three bars here, uh, lycosids are wolf spiders. And it's exactly what you would expect to find in the highest abundance 
across these three different locations. So um, there's more data to that and to that story, but I want to tell you a little bit about the dragonfly community. Um, we asked some similar questions. The difference here, though, is that dragonflies spend um, the first part of their lives and the longest part of their lives in water. And so this was a way to tie in studying the water and um, seeing if the runoff from any of the management plans and the managing of the golf course um, affected uh, negatively or, or positively the um, dragonfly community. So we were wondering, of course, um, just finding out Od Odonata is the um, order that dragonflies are in. So we wanted to know if there was species richness and abundance were different across these three locations um, and then across seasons because there's some seasonality involved here and then anything about the water quality that um, affected them. So we found um, through this study there's there's two species that were pretty commonly found the eastern pond hawk and the rosette skimmer which are beautiful dragonflies. Um, when they're in the larval stage or the um, what's known as the naiad stage um, they look very different and they um, either way they're voracious predators really good at what they do their strike rate on um, on catching in, um, insects on the fly is the highest strike rate of any animal um, that exists higher than a peregrine falcon higher than cheetahs so um, they're they're pretty impressive predators we did not find a difference in um, I, I don't think I include yeah I didn't include a graph for that one but we did not find a difference in um, the uh, richness or abundance across the, the different areas. And in fact, what surprised us the most is that the golf course where there were lots of runoff from um, the pesticides and, and the different chemicals they used to maintain that area actually had um, more dragonflies and, um, and a higher um, richness than the others, which was interesting. So I'd love to follow up on that. We haven't done anything yet to follow up on on that part of the um, project, but very interesting information. Uh, if you recall, one of the best practices is to not just um, include the experts um, in the asking the questions and doing the research, but we also wanted to engage the public and open this up and make it fun. So we hosted four citizen science events that were open to everyone that, that wanted to come. We utilized um, technology, iNaturalist, which is a, a nice app that actually has, um, in just five years since we completed this project, has changed dramatically in the best ways. They now have a, a part, um, a downloadable portion of the app known as Seek, S-E-E-K by iNaturalist that uses AI to um, help you in real time point your camera at a critter and um, and take a picture of it and it tells you um, what it is and where you find it and what the seasonality is and all the information that is important when you're studying natural history of organisms. You could also upload a picture to it and it'll tell you what it is. So it's one of the best tools um, that I've used now in my work, um, but it wasn't in use when we did this project. So we used old school. Um, you can see I have a paper, uh, just a, a clipboard right here, and um, we used paper and pencil to, to gather our data and um, uploaded pictures and things like that to iNaturalist. Um, this is actually another USM product um, that helped us. She, that's Jen Lamb. She got her bachelor's degree in biology and her PhD there as well, and is now a, um, an assistant professor at, at um, St. Cloud, I believe is, is the name of her university in Wisconsin. And then two more graduate students that were in um, Jake Schaefer's lab. This is Tom, who was an undergrad at Loyola with me, and I encouraged him to go to grad school at USM to study fishes. And um, and so that that was a pretty cool connection. And so he was more than willing to go in and, and help us stain for fishes and figure out what was in um, the lagoons there. Um, so I, I mentioned the students that did some of the work. Um, there were a lot of people involved in this project. And um, and so what I would call the impact of the project and what I um, presented to our uh, the donors that helped us do this work, um, I told them, you know, we really impacted more than 500 citizen scientists. So those are just people across those four different events that we did that came out that, 
you know, brought grandma or brought their uncle or whomever and uh, walked around with us and learned about natural history and then contributed to the BioBlitz by helping us recognize and identify um, the different flora and fauna and uh, just had a lot of fun. That's one of the best practices. So don't be afraid to have fun. Um, we invited scientists from, as I've told y'all already, USM, um, but also regionally, um, southeastern Louisiana. We had people from Nichols State, which is um, south of, of New Orleans. We had um, scientists from the University of New Orleans and Tulane all come and uh, help out as experts. And then um, 66 university students, not only um, the five student research projects, but there were others that contributed, helped with data collection, helped us with um, sorting through things, helping us add information to iNatural. So it, it really had a bit in, big impact and um, it, people still talk about the bio blitz that, uh, that we did that we um, finished in 2018. So um, that's a lot of information. There's a whole lot more to that story, but I thought I'd take that and kind of give you uh, how we built upon this for our next project that also implemented the best practices of informal science education. So through this project, and I mentioned that water was gonna be important. Um, so let me just kind of orient you to what you're seeing here. Um, this is a drawing done by an architectural firm. And um, this up here at the top is where Lake Pontchartrain would be. This is again, Bayou St. John. And then this is City Park with the lagoons. It's a different angle here, but it's important to show you. So there was a neighborhood over here, and then I mentioned that this is a neighborhood. This is Gentilly. One of the problems we have in New Orleans and, and really is a worldwide problem is water, water issues. In New Orleans, our water issues are that we have so much of it. And so one of the things that is happening in our city is that um, there's federal money that has come in to mitigate and help to reduce flooding in this neighborhood known as Gentilly. And even more specifically, this area right here that is outlined and is the focus of this um, drawing is a 26 acre property that's owned by um, nuns. And the nuns relocated after Katrina um, because of flooding, but also because their mother house got uh, struck by lightning and, and burned. So they wanted to use that property to help with the issue of flooding in our city, but also to teach people about environmental education. So we created and developed this, um, and, and the property is called Mirabu Water Garden. So eventually in about two years, it will be a water garden that looks very similar to this architectural drawing. Um, and it will be used for people to go and, um, you know, keep their minds healthy, keep their bodies healthy, um, reduce flooding. And so another way for us as informal STEM educators and scientists is to transform, in this case, a public work into a learning laboratory. So we created this project um, to implement on this property. Well, that was in, that was following our bio blitz. And you can see the date right here is 2020. So we submitted this in 2019, thinking that this project, this Mirabu project would be done, but um, the city's working very slowly. So we still did our project, but we had to change it up a little. One more thing I'll mention is just to show you that this Bayou St. John is connected to these lagoons um, at certain locations throughout the city park. And those are also connected to this water garden. And so there's a whole lot more to this story that involves geology and, um, and geography and, and lots of people contributing to um, making this happen. But let me take the opportunity to just tell you how we turned that bio blitz into the next project. Um, of course, this Mirabu water garden and this whole Gentilly resilience district that, that is being transformed um, got us really thinking about, you know, that water is water's an issue everywhere. So um, I created a couple of a, a course at Loyola to really help people think about water and, and how it relates to us, because you know, our entire city of New Orleans was founded based on its access to water. Um, and so water is an issue globally. 
So one of my students who um, graduated last year uh, put this slide together for me based on um, this Mirabu Water Garden. And so she was born in Haiti. Um, and so she wanted to relate it to her heritage. Um, of course, in Haiti, there are lots of issues with, well, across economics and po politics and everything. But one of their issues with water is that they have limited access to potable water. Um, and she actually was adopted uh, as a young child into a family that's from LA. And so in LA, the issue with water there is that, uh, well, right now they're getting a lot of rain, but typically they undergo extreme drought. And so um, she went from um, Haiti where they don't really have good you know, access to drinking water to a place where there's extreme droughts. And then she came to college in New Orleans where we receive way too much water at different times annually. And so we have issues with flooding. So that was her interest in, in this project. So we did a bunch of studying and we did a bunch of work to find out you know, how we can um, implement these best practices of informal science education into this uh, learning lab and teaching other people about it. And so one of the things we did was we read um, the geographer's book, Bienville's Dilemma, uh, Rich Campanella, I've got the citation there at the bottom for y'all, um, does a really good job of talking about the history of um, what Bienville and Iberville were brothers that founded the city of New Orleans. And um, a lot of what we know today, which involve environmental issues with water and environmental justice issues um, with our culture, stem back to um, this issue of being around water. Well, water is important because you need it to, to live. Um, it's also important, uh, as you see in this picture here, for commerce and for uh, transportation. Um, but actually, for those of you familiar with the French Quarter, this right here in this drawing is uh, St. Louis Cathedral. This is the oldest part of our city. This is the French Quarter because it was the highest ground. So we did a lot of work on studying um, this whole aspect of why New Orleans was settled where it was, why we, we um, you know, have issues with flooding. So it's, it's fascinating and I could talk for hours and hours. Well, I, I made a whole course out of it um, because it's so interesting. But for this project, what we focused on was, all right, so this whole, let me go back one slide. If we, if we look at the history, now we just focus in on how we've figured out how to live right here in an area that is, um, you know, right next to the Mississippi River, and um, the Lake Pontchartrain is up here in the, the northern part or the top part of this picture, which would be north of uh, the French Quarter. So, how did we learn to live like this? Well, about two hundred or so, well, the city of New Orleans, just so you know, is is a little over three hundred years old. Okay, so people have been living here. Um, I'll say the Europeans, because um, the Native Americans have been there a lot longer, but. Europeans have been living in uh, the city for a little over 300 years. And about 150 or so years ago, um, gray infrastructure was implemented. And so I'll just quickly tell you all about gray infrastructure. This is going to be anything that is concrete or um, helping with um, trying to pave um, and uh, pump out water. And so I don't know how much you all follow New Orleans and, and our history of water issues, but um, our pumps often fail. They're really old. Um, the, you know, concrete is not, uh, or most concrete is not uh, permeable. There are new technologies that are, that are coming into play. Um, but we tend to, uh, and what we've done historically for 150 years is anytime it rains, we, you know, the water goes into the street, it goes into the drain, hopefully um, not into your house. The pumps help pump it out and it pumps it in a very um, unnatural way. Um, it makes like 90 degree angles to get the water out to the lake. Again, there's a lot more to that story. But for now, I think that that's enough to kind of um, help you build upon um, what we then did. So if you travel anywhere around um, southeast Louisiana, you realize we're a coastal city. We're vulnerable to the flooding based on what I was just talking about. We face increasing threats of hurricanes, sea level rise, subsidence, the sinking because the river doesn't, um, we don't allow the river to overflow anymore because we've levied it up so we can't rebuild the land. Lots of stuff going on. 
but a lot of the people in our city don't understand. So there's this huge disconnect between the community's understanding of water management and relying solely on gray infrastructure. So um, people put concrete in their yards, which isn't permeable. So lots of issues surrounding that. Ideally, what would happen when um, for stormwater management is to use nature-based solutions and green infrastructure when it rains to let groundwater stay in place for longer, store and use it, drain it out when necessary with the pumps, but not rely solely on the pumps. And so that's the direction that we're going in the city right now. And there's all these really cool projects going on. Um, I'll show you a few of them here, showing you that people are now um, implementing and, and um, capturing their rainwater in rain barrels and using it to water their plants instead of um, their hoses as much. There are rain gardens in um, different pockets around the city, like this one in the top right, which is in that Gentilly neighborhood I was focused on before. People have put in a lot of, um, I, I'll, I'll use the word again, nature-based solutions. So utilizing native plants that soak up water better, putting in French drains to help to keep, retain, and detain um, water. So lots of really cool projects. Our take on it, though, was to figure out how to collaborate. And so um, some scientists and some designers at Loyola um, decided we would take advantage of that and create an academy to teach um, community members, teachers, and students um, how to live with water instead of trying to pump it out all um, and, and, and deal with, you know, rely on this gray infrastructure. So we got the funding to do this. And then of course, COVID happened. Um, and so we still had our first, so it was two workshops um, over two summers. The first one was a virtual workshop. Um, so we still hosted it online. And then the next year was of course better because it was in person and um, we were able to go around and see um, some of these examples of the best practices and have fun and go canoeing, all those things. Um, so just quickly, cause I know I'm running out of time. The, um, so this academy uh, was developed as a collaborative workshop and we incorporated uh, definitely interdisciplinary approach of science and design techniques. So um, talking about environmental education, so economic side of things, the political side of things, the technical side of things, um, because we wanted to um, get people thinking in a different way. And so um, I don't remember USM having a design program. Um, it y'all might now, but design thinkers think a lot like scientists. Um, and they go through these processes in very similar ways in the hopes of understanding social, cultural, ecological implications of how we manage water. Um, in in our city is is the approach we took, but um, design thinkers take it's it's almost like doing the process of science. So I um, collaborated with one of my colleagues, and um, she led our um, our summer workshops to get um, all of these different ways of thinking out there to our participants. Um, and working with designers was really great because they create really cool infographics like this when I ask them to. And so this is um, something that we created as the result of our um, academy. And it shows that we had um, as participants, 12 high school students, eight university students, one university staff member, a middle school teacher, three high school teachers, four university pr uh, professors, and 12 community members participate in our week long um, summer workshop to learn about how to live with water. So I'm going to kind of uh, go through that quickly because I'm out of time. Uh, we did some research on it. We found, um, so, so our hypothesis was basically, um, how, do we, uh, how do we figure out how to um, change people's thinking of living with water instead of just relying on gray infrastructure? So um, we did a, a quantitative and qualitative approach to this. And so these were some of our questions we asked, um, responses to an environmental attitude and action pre-post um, test that we gave. And you can see the shift um, from strongly disagree in, um, in our pre-workshop responses to our post-workshop. They definitely were reduced 
And if we, we did an overall analysis and um, found that our overall, the responses after the workshop, um, their attitudes were, were statistically significantly <laughs> better and more interested in making a difference and understanding these differences. So um, some, some good work done by some of our students there. Um, and I think I'm out of time. So um, I'll stop with um, putting up some of our qualitative responses. We asked um, the participants what their most important concept that they learned from the Loyal Academy. And um, so I highlighted a couple of things here that there are many solutions that the average citizen can implement to help solve complex problems and that they had no idea that the sea level rises and that we are sinking. I thought we were just sinking. Um, and there was a lot more than this, but these are just some of some of my favorites I pulled out to share with you all. OK, so. I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions that you might have or. Um, tell you more about spiders, <laughs> whatever y'all are interested in. Um, if you start her on spiders, the rest of us might need to leave because <laughs> you'll be here the rest of the day. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Oh, okay. no questions in the chat. Okay. So I do have one comment and uh, maybe two. Okay. So you kept emphasizing to make it fun. And I cannot agree with you more because when we are teaching, and I try to stress this to my elementary ed majors when I'm teaching to them, that if you're miserable, then your students are probably miserable and you need to shake it up because it, life's too short to spend days on end being bored and miserable. Agreed. <laughs> and there's too yeah, much definitely. fun stuff in science. Um, well, uh, one of the things I'm just, I'll add to that um, because you're totally right. One of the things that we learned from that outside um, project I did with at USM is that um, the kids lose their interest in science in the middle school. And that's why we targeted middle school for that actual project, which I know I didn't talk about today. Um, but that's one of the things that you can do to keep their interest in it is to show them that it's fun and it's not all memorizing facts. And so the fact that the best practices include that it make it fun, it just like supported it, like what you've always known and what I've always known in my teaching. And so it's nice to have the data to back it up. Does anybody else have questions or anything for Dr. Thomas? Yes, Dr. Thomas. Hi, how are you, former yeah. professor of mine? Do we go back to the 90s or something we like do. that? We don't, do. Don't tell anybody my age. Come on. <laughs> yes, we do go back to the 90s. I took an undergraduate class from you when I was a senior, I believe. Okay, well, it... it it set you forward for life, didn't it? It uh, did. But any, anyway, do you think we can move New Orleans and tear down the levees? <laughs> it, <laughs> it, uh, uh, because what are we going to do about those levees? Yep. Well, it's, it's definitely an issue. Um, one of the things that we talk about all the time, and it's always in the news, and it's always something that, you know, seminar speakers talk about when they're here is about that issue. And so we have levied up for, you know, close to 300 years and prevented the natural, you know, traversing of that Mississippi River. And so we've got to figure out what we can do to, um, so no, I'm not a proponent of removing the levees and letting New Orleans uh, go away, but I am a proponent of coming up with creative, diverse ways to um, start making a difference by uh, helping out the habitats and restoring the habitats, restoration projects. Yes, well, that's very good. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to do is to, to work on our college campus in Hattiesburg. You know, like uh, do tree inventories and stuff. And the outdoor world right around the school is, tends to be ignored, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. I wish I had thought of that when I was there, but um, I wasn't doing the, these kinds of projects then. And I love, I actually have one on Loyalist campus right now. Um, we're doing a flora and fauna um, study because they're not done and you need to, why not utilize that? 
um, in your classes? I mean, it's it's a great learning lab. Yes, I've always thought so. And um, uh, it's good for the administration to realize the importance of the grounds uh, to making a school attractive for students, mm -hmm. as well as the learning experience. So yeah, you do well, Lake Byron. Lake Byron's a good place to, I mean, we used to utilize that all the time, right? Well, it sounds like you're doing a wonderful job making use of New Orleans natural areas. And that was very interesting about that waterway, about how the French Quarter was found. It's very interesting. That, yes, I've, I've, I grew up here and um, I, I've learned so much in the 12 years that I've been back um, that I did not know growing up. And it's fascinating. And what uh, some of the work I'm doing now involves um, the resiliency, sustainability and justice side of environmental things. And it's all about the way in which our city was founded. I mean, it's, there's a, uh, I'm not a social scientist at all, but I'm learning from the social scientists about the overlap of why the poorer neighborhoods are where they are. And it has to do with the fact that they were, um, you know, the affordable places because they were the flood zones. And it, it's fascinating. I mean, there's so much to the story, but that Rich Campanella book, I can't stress it enough. If, if those things fascinate you, I mean, he's written several of them, but Bienville's dilemma really changed my thinking and the projects that I do now. Well, I'm very proud for you, Amy. You've done life right. Thank you. Well, fun was always important to me. <laughs> Good deal. Somebody chip in. <laughs> We may have to pick your brain for some collaboration to do something similar with the green aspect of dealing with water in Hattiesburg. Really? Okay. <laughs> Where are the issues now with, with water there? Uh, because the infrastructure is just aged. Um, there's all, there's, I mean, there's always been some flooding issues and it's just continued. So I think looking at ways to assist the communities because it's in, in neighborhoods, is mm -hmm. all neighborhoods, all of well, them. Well, look up nature-based solutions. I showed y'all a couple of them, but, um, but that's it. I mean, when you, when you concrete up everywhere, not only does it make the water go somewhere else, but it also, um, there's the heat island effect of it too. I mean, I didn't even get into that. But that's a thing that New Orleans is hotter than other areas because of all the concrete that we have. Um, I mean, that's just one example. Are there any other questions for Dr. Thomas? I guess I have a question. Um, because I was thinking about, you've done a lot in the local, like, natural areas, but, you know, I actually live in Slidell, so I was in New Orleans recently for at the, the Children's Museum Mudfest in City Park, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you've been able to do anything with other institutional kind of organizations beyond just, like, the natural settings um, in New Orleans. Yeah, so um, the Children's Museum is an incredible example in the city park where they implemented based on some of this work um, when they moved from downtown to city park, um, a lot of green infrastructure. So when you go there um, next time, or even if you can pull it up online, you'll see where you park right next to the building, there's what's called a bioswale um, right there with native grasses that, um, and then cypress trees and um, some of the uh, plant species that absorb at a higher rate than, um, than others. And so um, Julia, who was the, Julia Bland was the director that helped move the, um, and she has since retired, but she was cognizant and always bringing in the architects that came up with this whole living with water theme and um, were, are the lead architects on that Mirabu Water Garden project. And I work with them a lot um to well i they taught at our academy but also just to keep up with what's going on so they designed um intentionally 
all those water um, retention areas around um, that. So yes, I do work with them. Um, as a member of Master Naturalist, we volunteer and we lead workshops. Um, we actually have two cohorts a year, so I do a lot of work in City Park with um, the Master Naturalist on that as well. That's cool. And we volunteer it at the museum. Cool. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, we are coming upon our one o'clock hour in the next couple of minutes. Um, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for sharing your work. I'm always excited to hear what you're doing because it's always Yay, fun. <laughs> fun to see familiar faces, and I'm glad that y'all are doing so well at USM. And same to you. Thank you so much. All righty. Y'all take care. We'll keep going through the decades, eh, May? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.